chief of Israel to come into the sanctuary and to join us in our worship service this morning. I'm wondering if you wouldn't mind rising for just a few moments and greeting the folks around them, around you, and letting them know you're happy to be here this morning with them. You can find your seats now. Let's uh, begin to focus our attention on the Lord and His goodness. As a call to worship this morning, I would turn your attention to Psalm 34. I want you to think about these words. Uh, they somewhat uh, fit well, I think, with what Pastor James is going to say to us concerning the book of Acts and Paul and his testimony in Jerusalem, listen to what David says in Psalm 34, the first seven verses. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul will make its boast in the Lord. The humble will hear it and rejoice. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears they looked to him, and they were radiant. Their faces will never be ashamed. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all of his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and rescues them. I'm going to ask you to bow with me in a word of prayer as we commit our service to the Lord this morning. Let's pray. Our gracious and loving Heavenly Father, Almighty God, our goal in this service today is to praise and to bless you, to magnify your name. You are the only one who can deliver us from our fears and restore in us that radiant joy and confidence in your goodness. And so today, Father, as we worship you in spirit and in truth, praising and blessing your name, we ask, Lord, that you would receive that which we offer you, and you would use it, Father, as we sing, as we pray, as we give, and as we hear your word proclaimed. We pray, Father, that you would use all of these things to bless your name and to build your kingdom. This morning, we bow before you as our king and as our master. For we pray these things in Jesus' precious name today. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Let's sing together. We have come to this place to worship him. Please join us. As we lift up our hands, will you meet us here? As we call on your name, will you meet us here? We have come to this place to worship you, God of mercy and grace. Thank you. 
stand with us. <laughs> Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine.
Church is in the sexual battle of its life. If you take a, just a standard cookie cutter Christian, don't do this, don't do that, it won't work. It's going to really sweep through the church like a tsunami wave of destruction of the family. I had wanted to fly a jet aircraft since I was four years old. I wanted to be a fighter pilot. Hey. And so it was all I was living for. Still think you're a hot shot? You won't last 10 seconds in combat. You know how to fly, but you don't know how to fight. You have to understand how the enemy is personally bushwhacking you. I was an alcoholic. I was a sex addict. I was completely out of control. Like I had a rope around my leg, they have a noose around their soul. And the harder they pull against it, the worse it gets. That's why trying harder doesn't work. You have to know your enemy if you're going to win. It's not just going to go away. Just the power of sexual bondage. It promises you everything, gives you absolutely nothing. It feels as if there's no hope you're never getting out of this. But the shed blood of Jesus Christ guarantees there's a way out. God guarantees you. His word is very clear. The curse will be visited the third or fourth generation. We will create trails in our brain that are just going to fire on an automatic sequence. You're fighting for the very lineage that God gave you. What a man does in life becomes history, but what he puts into motion becomes his legacy. And if you will break this curse, then your sons and your daughters have a better shot. It took me three and a half years, but I'll tell you now, you know what I'm having the joy of? is sweet revenge. The very thing the enemy used against me as a weapon, now God is forged by the hammer of his adversity that he's brought in my life, by the hammer of his challenges, by the correction of my soul, and he's formed it into a weapon, and I'm taking sweet revenge against the enemy. And that's what God has for you. bad day determine who you are and how you can fly. It will put a weapon in your hand that you can conquer and begin to help other men. I believe in you, Roberts. Good morning. I hope you won't get sick of us by the time we start this program, but we just feel that it's vitally important to bring this to the forefront. Um, I had the privilege just last week to go fishing with a bunch of guys and uh, there was a very philosophical question that was asked around the table and uh, regarding our faith and if we had an opportunity, if we were given one opportunity to ask Jesus one question, what would it be? And I'm not going to tell you the answers that we got around the table, but I'll tell you this, that guys do struggle with different things. 
Um, and this one aspect creates so much um, guilt and so much shame that there's no wonder that mental illness is such go running so rampant in our communities. Um, if you can't get, under, get out from underneath this guilt and this shame, there's no healing that can happen. And that's what Jerome and myself, our plan is to run this program to give us men the tools that we need to break this bondage and to fight back. We know that it's a private subject. We know that it's something that we don't want to admit because it's embarrassing. We get that. But I implore you, I encourage you, I challenge you men that if you know somebody or yourself are going through this guilt and this shame, please sign up for this program. There's a saying that what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. There will be no judgment. There will be only encouragement, uplifting. So I encourage you to sign up for this program. Our plan is to start at Wednesday, September 25th in the evening. It'll be here at the church. Uh, I think Jerome has some of the books here. Uh, there's a journal that you'll receive a study guide that will follow along with the DVDs that we'll be covering and uh, for you to take home. And uh, I hope that we can begin to fight back and to win this battle. You saw the percentage up there. It's an American DVD. 68% um, of men uh, either watch porn or are addicted to sexual sins. Um, to put that to a more concrete number, if you look down your aisle of 10 people, if there are 10 men in that aisle, seven of you watch porn on a regular basis. And that's not to put any kind of, point any kind of fingers, it's just the rock solid truth. And it's not discriminating. So I would challenge you and encourage you. Jesus died on the cross for us to be free of bondage, free of the control that sin has over our lives. Why don't we want to take that power and use it to the best of the abilities he's given us? I forgot anything, Jerome? So our phone numbers are in the bulletin under looking ahead number four. Um, we say at, we're, we're starting at the age of 15 or older, um, and we mean it. It doesn't matter if you're 15, 30, 80, 90, 75, Please, if you're struggling in this, sign up. It'll be, I'm hoping it'll be one of the best things that, uh, that we've done. Good morning. <clears throat> Church picnic, believe it or not, next Sunday, uh, September 8th. Uh, the service will be in the park, so everything will be happening in the park next Sunday. Please be aware of that. Uh, the uh, service will start in the morning with Teen Challenge. It's led by Terry Thiessen and his group. Uh, and, of course, after the service will be lunch, which is in the form of a chili cook-off. And the desserts will be happening later on in the afternoon in the form of a dessert bake-off. So uh, first prize, we're wearing them. This is the, the apron made by Betty Claussen for the chili cook-off, and then the dessert bake-off will be the apron for the, uh, the, with the cupcakes and whatever else on there. A uh, huge thank you to the people who have signed up for the chili. We're done with the chili. We have enough chili to do it. Uh, maybe one or two people need to sign up for the desserts yet, otherwise the, that list is full. Um, as far as the serving and stuff goes, we still need several people to help with serving and also to run uh, some of the things for children, uh, children's features. So uh, the activity, sorry, so still need some help with that. If you think that that's something you could give us a hand with, that'd be great. If you have signed up for the chili, uh, we have frozen hamburger here today. If you want to make yourself available to that, uh, talk to us after the service. So we'll have that ready. Um, the, the judging, maybe some of you have wondered about this, how we're going to test the different chilies and stuff. We've actually left that responsibility to the guys from Teen Challenge are doing it. So... The impartial outside party is going to come in and, and, and judge to see who's got the best chilies and the best bake-offs. Um, so the desserts there, if you've, if you've put your name on the list for desserts, um, 
If you want to have your desserts as part of the bake-off, could you please uh, bring a small, a separate tray, a small tray, uh, so that we can serve that right after the lunch, just for the teen challenge group, because they won't be sticking around till four o'clock for the rest of us. So if you want to, if you want to uh, enter your d uh, dessert, please make a small tray ready, and then we'll have it together with yours. But it'll be served early, just for the teen challenge group. Also, if you're not sure about parking, there is valet parking that's going to be there. It's going to be available for you. So please don't come if you have um, any hang-ups with that. Um, if you have any questions, by all means, uh, the, the group is uh, Jonathan and Lisa and uh, Marilyn and myself. If you have any questions, we'll either be in the back after the service or you can also phone us uh, during the week. It's no problem. Uh, looking forward to it a lot. We've put a lot of... Um, a lot of people have put a lot into this, so we're looking forward to it. We're excited about it, and we'll, we'll see you next Sunday. Thanks so much. So this morning, we've gone from conquering to cooking. And now just a couple of other community life announcements for you, just so that you're up to date. Um, so you have in your bulletin that blue insert, which will tell you about the activities for next Sunday out at Winkler Bible Camp. Teen Challenge is going to be with us in the morning for the service. And we're certainly looking forward to that. Just in addition, and very briefly, also the Sunday School kickoff will be happening in just a week or so. I think we're starting September 15th. Right. And as you can see under take note number four, there are still a number of folks needed to help make the Sunday School run effectively and efficiently. So please take a look at that. And there are... Uh, there's on the Sunday School board up in the foyer, you can see it on the south side of the, the second pillar. There are some positions there that you might want to look at and ask the Lord about and serve in. Also under number five, uh, take note, uh, I'm going to be doing something a little different this fall. Instead of teaching an adult English Sunday School class, as I've done for many years already and thoroughly enjoyed that, I'm going to shift focus a little bit. So if you are uh, between the ages of 18 and 25, I want to invite you to join me on September 15th, 9.15 in the chapel, and we're going to begin a discipleship group for 18 to 25-year-olds. And we're going to begin with a very basic subject of how do you study your Bible. And I'm really looking forward to that. So I have a number of things planned and uh, certainly looking forward to having you there. So if you know of somebody who is age 18 to 25, we're really going to look forward to that time together. Also under looking ahead, number two, mornings, uh, Mums Morning Out registration. It's going to be held on September 17th from 10 to 11 in the church foyer. Please read that uh, carefully. Also, if you want more information, if you flip the page over, there's contact information through Tamara Friesen or Tana Sweep, and their numbers are listed. As we conclude our community life announcements, just to let you know in sympathy, um, Jacob B. Neufeld of Blue Creek Belize, father to Henry and Anna Neufeld, and uncle to Juan and Susan, passed away on August 17th, and of course, memorial services were conducted on Tuesday, August 20th in Blue Creek. In conjunction with that, James Dick, the nephew to Henry and Anna Neufeld, passed away as a result of a motorcycle accident in Belize, and of course, the funeral services were conducted there as well. Thirdly, uh, Betty Jean Duick, mother to Randy and Phyllis Duick, passed away on August 24th, and memorial services were conducted on the 29th in the Burke Teller Church. And finally, Wes Weave, father to Wanda and to Jerry Friesen, passed away on Wednesday, 20, August 28th, and memorial services were conducted yesterday at the Winkler Mennonite Church. And we want to add our prayers for these families as they mourn, as they grieve, and as they remember. I'll call the ushers forward now to receive the morning offering, and let's bow in prayer before the Lord. Our Father, as we have worshipped you in spirit and in truth this morning, we recognize your greatness and your goodness to us. And as a demonstration, Father, of your greatness and of your goodness and of your ability to release us from the grip of materialism, we come before you this morning and we give our offering to you. We thank you, Father, for all that you have provided us with, and uh, we thank you for the way that you have blessed us. And now we return to you a portion of that which you have given to us, that we might demonstrate your goodness and grace, uh, grace and goodness in our life each day. So receive that which we offer you this way, by, by way of offering, and use it to build the kingdom. 
We pray these things in Jesus' precious name this morning. Amen. We'd like to introduce the song of the month for September. It's called Who You Say I Am. Uh, may or may not be familiar to you, but uh, join us as you are able. Before we get into the pastoral prayer for this morning, I would like to make or highlight another announcement that is in your bulletin on the back page under looking ahead. Number three, Creation Ministries International will be here in our church on September 19th. That's a Thursday evening. And they'll be here doing a couple of sessions on creation as their the title of their mission indicates. Uh, you have the two titles there, Creation and Evolution or the Creation Evolution Ladder, which side is more stable. That session will be at 6.30, and then there will be a short break. And then at 7.45 will be the session on which history best explains dinosaurs, creation, or evolution. And so our, I've had one person comment to me that this sounds like it's a debate. It's not a debate. It's just taking a look at what Scripture says about creation and the many different things we hear about creation 
And uh, you might wonder why dinosaurs? Well, you know there's many sources that talk about there's different ages of dinosaurs and so on. And so we just want to give ourselves an opportunity to be reminded of what scripture teaches about creation and so on. And so we look forward to all of you coming out and invite friends and family and neighbors and so on. And along with that, I will need a few volunteers to help uh, on that evening with uh, setting up and with being, uh, manning the book tables and so on. So if you would feel, uh, feel led to uh, help out with that evening's event, please contact me. We look forward to that event. For pastoral prayer this morning, uh, as I was preparing the message for this morning um, and thinking about this morning's service as a whole, I thought it might be good to base our pastoral prayer on uh, 2 Timothy 4, verses 1 through 5. I have a slide there. I'm not sure if James has it ready to go. Um, but let me read that and then we'll go into prayer. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in the view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For a time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you, keep your head in all situations, endure hardship, do the work of, the, of an evangelist, and discharge all the duties of your ministry. Father God, as we think about those instructions that you gave to your servant Timothy, and as we think about the series we've been going through in the book of Acts, and the events that happened there, and with with the boldness and the strength that your servants, your apostles, spoke the gospel and stuck to the truth. It is a challenge to us in our lives, in our faith, in our telling of the gospel story, in our giving our testimony. Do we boldly do it? Are we prepared in season and out? Are we prepared to correct, to rebuke, to encourage? Father, this morning we are gathered together because we know we need encouragement from you. We know we need encouragement from your word. The world that we live in has all kinds of challenges. At a funeral I was at recently, I heard the loved one saying to the one on the deathbed, life isn't easy, is it? And he responded, who said it would be? Lord, too often, I think we get caught up in the idea that life should be easy. That as your children, as Christians, everything should fall into place without problem and effort. And Lord, we know from history, we know from your word, we know from our own experience, that just is not the case. Are there good times? Absolutely. And we give you honor and praise for them. And we give you honor and praise for the difficult times as well. For it is in those times that we understand and that we learn that you are the one that carries us. You are the one that holds our hand. And Father, we know that in our midst here this morning, there's people who have experienced different things throughout this week. Things that are pleasant, 
things that were uncomfortable, things that were painful, things that were wonderful, from one extreme to another. And Lord, we know that you were present with us through it all, even if we didn't always feel it at the time. Here in this passage that I read, you, you encourage Timothy through Paul to remain faithful, to keep faithful to his calling, to the ministry you had given him. So Lord, that is our prayer this morning, that as we continue to worship you, to honor you, to praise you, that we would be encouraged to continue to follow through, to complete the task, the assignment, the calling that you have placed on each one of our, our lives. Father, may we be faithful to you in and through them each and every day till you come again. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you please stand as Monica comes to read scripture with us. Job as, I'll try to do as good a job as Paul would. Not this Paul, the uh, Gertz and Paul. I love any opportunity to tell a lame joke on stage. <laughs> Acts 22, uh, 2 to 21 is the passage today. When they heard him speak to them in Aramaic, they became very quiet. Then Paul said, I am a Jew, born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city. I studied under Gamaliel and was thoroughly trained in the law of our ancestors. I was just as zealous for God as any of you are today. I persecuted the followers of this way to their death arresting both men and women, and throwing them into prison, as the high priest and all the council can themselves attest. I even obtained letters from them to their associates in Damascus, and then to their, and then to their associates in Damascus, and went there to bring these people as prisoners to Jerusalem to be punished. About noon, as I came near Damascus, suddenly a bright light from heaven flashed around me. I fell to the ground and heard a voice say to me, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? I asked. I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting, he replied. My companions saw the light, but they did not understand the voice of him who was speaking to me. What shall I do, Lord? I asked. Get up, the Lord said, and go to Damascus. There you will be told all that you have been assigned to do. My companions led me by the hand into Damascus because the brilliance of the light had blinded me. A man named Ananias came to see me. He was a devout observer of the law and highly respected by all the Jews living there. He stood beside me and said, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very moment, I was able to see him. Then he said, The God of our ancestors has chosen you to know his will and to see the righteous one and to hear words from his mouth. You will be his witness to all people of what you have seen and heard. And now what are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized, and wash your sins away, calling on his name. When I returned to Jerusalem and was praying at the temple, I fell into a trance and saw the Lord speaking to me. Quick, he said, leave Jerusalem immediately, because the people here will not accept your testimony about me. Lord, I replied, these people know that I went from one synagogue to another to imprison and beat those who believe in you. And when the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed, I stood there giving, giving my approval and guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. Then the Lord said to me, Go, I will send you away, from, away to the Gentiles. I want to take us this morning to start this uh, message. I want to take us on a little journey to Jerusalem. 
just to get a sense of the setting of Acts chapter 22 and Acts chapter 23. Uh, the picture that you see now is uh, the, the golden dome that you see. You've probably seen that picture when you see pictures of Jerusalem, the picture of the golden, uh, the dome of the rock. And then off to the, off to the left is with the black roof and the black little dome is a mosque. And uh, where the dome of the rock is, that golden dome, that is the location of the temple. That is where the temple stood. And then on the next picture, uh, there is, if you see the arches that are just on the left, just underneath the words, the temple stood just to the left, those arches were on the other picture as well. And down below is the old city wall, and the eastern gate is right on the right-hand side. It's a little bit faded, but it's closed off with brick. That's why you don't see the gate. But that's the eastern gate, the golden gate. And then up along just on top of the evergreen trees there, that building that you see with the tower right in the middle, it's a Fortress Antonia, also known as the Roman barracks. And so where the Jews started to have their skirmish with Paul would have been, it was in the temple where they started disagreeing with him. They left the temple and they shut the temple doors behind him. And then where they beat him and where they tried to kill him would have been right in the area where you see the arches on the left there, somewhere in that area. And from there is where the Roman soldiers came in to save Paul, and they would have been in the barracks that were just up over to the right, or to the north of the temple. And so they, the purpose for these barracks, for this garrison to be there, was for the Romans to keep an eye on what the Jews were doing. They didn't quite trust them. They thought they might, you know, create an uprising or whatever. They gave them a lot of freedom in their worship, but yet they kept a close eye on them. And so the Roman soldiers were right close by to where this was all happening as, um, as the Jews were beating Paul. And that was earlier from chapter 21 when that happened. And so I hope this just gives you a sense of the setting in which it happened. These buildings were close to each other. The soldiers were in the area and uh, they were watching. Any time the Jews would do things that would uh, arouse suspicion or look like trouble was coming, they were right close by. And so it was on the steps of those uh, barracks where Paul gives his testimony, which Monica read for us just now. And so um, for me, anyways, it, it helps to have a picture of, of what happened, where it happened. If you don't kind of have that, I know these are only pictures, you haven't seen it in real, this is about as close as I got as well. We were up on the Mount of Olives. That's where I took the picture from. Um, I didn't go see the barracks up close, but it still gives an idea of the, of the surroundings and of the setting. So in our time together this morning, we want to take a look at what it means to be a witness for Jesus. In the middle of Paul's testimony, which was just read for us, his testimony to the Jews... And he reminded them of the task that God had given him through Ananias. You will be my witnesses, or you will be his witness to all people of what you have seen and heard. This is what God told Paul through Ananias in Damascus. And so he continues on telling them of a time when he had been in the temple praying, and the Lord told him to leave Jerusalem because the people would not accept his message. In other words, they would not like what he had to tell them. So this wasn't the first time that Paul had been in Jerusalem, and it wasn't the first time. Well, the first time he was there, God gave him this warning, and now he was actually experiencing uh, that the people didn't like what he had to say. And so the question here was, that came to my mind is, have I ever been involved or have you ever been involved in a conversation in which what you said was not appreciated by the other party, even though it was truth, gospel truth? I have. One such conversation ended by the person telling, uh, the person that I was talking with telling me, as long as I go to church on Sunday, 
And as long as I keep the prescribed holidays that are instituted by the church, that's all I need to do for the church. The rest of the time is mine to do with as I please. And that's how he walked away. That was the end of the conversation. The context of this conversation had been about Jesus and about how his presence in our lives should affect every area of our lives, regardless if it was at work, regardless if it was at home, regardless if it was on holidays or Sunday morning in church. It doesn't matter. Jesus should impact every area, every aspect of our lives. That was the context of the conversation. And so we may wonder how this person could have responded as he did. However, even though we wonder that, this kind of response is more common than we may think. Not everyone will admit it or say it out loud. Not everyone will connect it to the church per se. And not everyone will even admit that they think it. However, I believe it is quite common for Christians to have their faith in a compartment that is separate from the rest of their lives. And you may have heard me say that before over the last time or two that I've been up here, talking about these compartments, these, the secularization, the separation of faith from the rest of life. And the reason that keeps coming up is because that's what Scripture talks about. It tells us that our faith, our relationship with Jesus, is supposed to infiltrate every aspect of our life. There is, should be no separation between our faith and the rest of our lives. It should be one and the same. So just, we just listened to the reading of Paul's testimony. Did you catch the connection that he made to his own people? And how he didn't avoid making his listeners uncomfortable? Did you catch that? He started out by making very sure that they understood that he was one of them. That he was a Jew through and through, just like they were. He left no doubt in the mind of his audience. And they should have understood that he had been as devout and committed to the Jewish faith and way of life as they had been. In fact, Paul had been among the elite. Paul was a Pharisee. He had been taught by one of the best. He had been in the top school of Pharisees. And he had promoted and defended the Jewish way of life at all costs. He even hunted down Christians, putting them in jail, and even killing some. You may recognize this phrase as well from a few Sundays ago. Paul was an all-in kind of person. And he lived that way before his conversion, before he received Christ, and after. He did what he did with his whole being. He did it wholeheartedly and putting his whole energy into it. And now as he stood on the steps of these Roman barracks and he spoke boldly to his fellow Jews about Jesus, hoping they would listen with their hearts, meaning listen with their whole being and not just with their heads. He wanted them to understand that God had kept his word about the Messiah, that the Messiah had come and that the Messiah was waiting for their response. Keep in mind that as he spoke to this very people, keep in mind that the people he spoke to were the very ones who just minutes before had tried to kill him outside the temple. As they dragged him out of the temple, they locked the door behind him, and they started beating him. And that's when the Roman soldiers came from the barracks, from the garrison that stepped in, and in essence saved Paul's life. I don't know about you, but I think I would have kept quiet. (laughs) These people, they beat me. They wanted to kill me. Why would I try talking to them again? What purpose would that have? But not Paul. Remember two Sundays ago we talked about his single-mindedness. He had one thing in mind, and that was to be faithful to the calling that Christ had given him to preach the gospel. To preach the gospel and make the Messiah known. 
and he took every opportunity to speak the truth about Jesus, no matter what the potential, no matter what the potential consequences might have been, and no matter whether they liked what he said or not. And as I said two Sundays ago, we need to live our faith in such a way that it is convincing to others, that they will see our faith for what it is. Should we explain our faith at times? Absolutely. But it should line up with what people see in us. Our faith needs to be an all-in kind of faith. So much so that there is no logical or cultural explanation for it. Rather, the only explanation is God's presence via the Holy Spirit. Listen to this statement made by Charles Swindoll in regards to us boldly giving our testimony. People won't like what we have to say, and our job is not to change their minds. Our responsibility is to proclaim the truth. Nothing more and nothing less. Our job as a witness to the gospel of Jesus is to present the truth to tell others about what Jesus has done for us. We do not need to have agreement from them. We are just to be faithful in giving testimony to Jesus' saving grace and his redeeming work in our lives. Nothing more and nothing less. You see, when someone tells you about their experience, or you tell someone about your experience, tell someone your testimony, You cannot go to them and say, well, that didn't happen because you weren't there. It's their testimony of how Jesus works in their life. And that is how Paul could tell his testimony to this audience who was hostile towards him. And they had nothing to say about it until the end because Jesus was just relating, or Paul was just relating what Jesus had done in his life in Damascus. And people not liking what Paul had to say didn't stop him from giving witness to the truth, and nor should it stop us. I know that people don't always like to hear the truth of God's word because it challenges their comfort zone. It challenges our comfort on two different levels, both in our what we call our physical lives and our spiritual ways, our spiritual lives. Because it confronts our motives. It confronts our goals. We have become so accustomed to going with the flow and keeping up with the Joneses that we think it is normal and okay to put our faith on the side burner while we put our desires and wishes on the main grill. Our faith, our relationship with Jesus should be the main course in our lives. With all the other blessings coming around side of that. But all too often I see us getting this turned around and we put Jesus and our faith as a side. So who here likes a good barbecue? A lot of us, right? And what is the main part of the barbecue? The steak, the chicken, the pork, whatever it is, the meat of it. As you can see in these pictures, the focal point is the meat. That is the center of it. The potatoes and the veggies are always off to the side of the plate. They're they're the side blessings of the main course. And this is how it should be with our relationship with Jesus, with our faith. Jesus should always be the main course, never the side should always be the main course. That is the point that Paul was trying to drive home as he shared his testimony once again with the Jews in Jerusalem. The Jews in Jerusalem had things mixed up, and Paul was trying to help them reorder their priorities. However, as they listened to Paul, they only saw that their their way of life as they knew it, their religion as they knew it, was being challenged. And so they seem to have zero interest in the truth about Jesus as they listen to Paul speak. 
And as Paul came close to the end of his testimony from those barrack steps, he included a very interesting part of his story. It was a part he could have easily left out, but he didn't. See, up until now, he had been telling them about his personal experience with Jesus, and they couldn't argue that, or they didn't, didn't respond to that until this point. He told of his involvement with the stoning of Stephen. Up to this point in his testimony, the crowd listened. They listened to him speak as he described his encounter with Jesus on the Damascus Road. He told of how Jesus introduced himself, how a man named Ananias would, become, would, would come and minister to him, or did come and minister to him and restored his sight. He told of how God had chosen him to know his will and to proclaim his truths as he would give witness to the promised Messiah. The crowd listened to all of this. But when Paul came to the part of him being involved in Stephen's stoning, when he came to the part of telling how he too had once been in opposition to Christians along with them, the crowd started shouting, rid the earth of him, and they threw off their robes and threw dust in the air. They were so agitated by the implication that Paul was making about them because through this story of Stephen, Paul was telling them, look, I too was once like you are. I too used to do the same things that you are now doing, still doing and you are doing to me. This was way too much for the crowd to handle, and they threw one huge collective temper tantrum. The crowd did not like what Paul had to say, and they let it be known. So how do you, how do I respond? How do we respond when we hear testimonies about Jesus working in the lives of people. Oh, we like to hear them. We like to hear people's stories. But how do we respond? How do we respond to what we hear? Does it make a difference? Does what we hear make a difference in how we live? In how we respond to Jesus and his work in our lives? Or does it cause us to dig our heels in deeper and just stand our ground wherever it is that we're at? To stand firm in that which we have known up to this point. All throughout Paul's ministry so far, there has been opposition alongside of all these successes. His ministry was one which bore much fruit as people responded to the gospel of Jesus in the cities that he witnessed in in the cities that he preached in. However, he also had a lot of resistance along the way, opposition to what he was doing and to the one he was proclaiming. So what can we learn from Paul's example? We can learn that there is never a time to give up, believing in and sharing about Jesus, the Messiah, the one who saves, the one who redeems, and the one who gives life to the lifeless. The Jews who were in opposition to Paul's testimony were concerned about one thing and one thing only. They wanted their way of life to stay as it was. They wanted their status quo to remain as is. Don't mess with it. Leave us alone. The things that they had worked so hard to achieve were at stake because the truth of the gospel breaks down all human attempts to enter into a right relationship with God. The things they worked so hard to achieve were at stake because the truth of the gospel breaks down all human attempts to enter into a right relationship with God. The gospel of Jesus confronted that which was of most importance to them, and they responded with a temper tantrum. 
Has the truth of the gospel confronted what you see as important in life? Have you had to decide between your own desires and God's desires for you? How important is your faith in Jesus in your life? Does your faith, does Jesus infiltrate every aspect, every area of your lives? I have shared with you before about people who are in their last days of life, how they start to prioritize or see things differently than they did before. Things that are important to them change as the reality of death and eternity set in. Set in. Oftentimes it seems that when a person has lost the ability to control their own life, it is only then that their heart is fully open and toward, turned toward God, allowing him to be in control. I have a testimony that I want to share with you this morning. This testimony is from Karen Hebert. She and her husband Rod are facing the reality of eternity and death right now, even as we gather together here. As Karen's physical strength slowly fades, she has some thoughts she would like to share with us. And what I'm going to read is from a conversation that she had with Pastor Dale two weeks ago. We have a picture of them up on the slide, or up on the PowerPoint. Listen to this conversation. In conversation with Karen Hebert on August 19th at Boundary Trails Hospital, she made a pointed and personal observation which I have permission to share with you as a congregation. It's something that I think is well worth hearing because it comes as a testimony from someone who is currently living out its truth. We were talking about her terminal diagnosis and how in the process of health decline and becoming successively weaker in strength, Karen's perception of the reality of heaven and our need to be ready for it had, come, had become all the more sharp and urgent. What stuck with me most profoundly was her observation that healthy people sit in worship services, after, in worship service after worship service, while the pastor proclaims God's truth and talks about heaven and the need to be ready for it. And when the service is over, they return to their everyday lives without letting the significance of what was said really settle in and make a difference in their lives and make a difference in their living. When faced with a terminal, Ill, terminal diagnosis, however, and experiencing the reality of life slipping away as health declines and the prospect of death looms larger with each passing day, the cares of this world become less and less significant. What replaces the mundane cares of this world is the absolute reality that heaven is coming closer with every passing day and that the need to listen to what God says in his word in the end is what matters most. And even more than that, receiving Jesus as Savior is the most significant decision one can ever make. And so in this simple and brief testimony from Karen, we have the witness of someone who is seeing life very differently than each one of us here sees life this morning. We came here in relative good health, and if we let God speak to us through her testimony, perhaps we will sit a little straighter, listen a little more carefully, think a little more deeply about why we are in this worship service this morning. And most importantly, to make sure that we have received Jesus as our Savior, because in the end, our dis because in the end, our decision concerning Jesus will make the critical difference in where we spend eternity. I'd like to say thank you to Karen for sharing her testimony with us. For sharing her testimony, being bold and brave to share what is on her heart and the things that she has come to learn in the time of life that she is in right now. The observations that she makes are powerful. The observations that she makes about life 
and what we see most as most important in our lives need to be thought about. We need to apply them, think about them, learn from them. So what is our response to the gospel of Jesus Christ? What difference does hearing the truths of Scripture make in our day-to-day lives? Do we allow them to penetrate our heart and our mind? Or do we not like what we hear? Worship team.
So this morning, as we have listened to God's word, we've looked into his word, we've sung of his truths, we just sang of God being everlasting, forever and ever, from all time before time began and forever. We sang of his sovereignty. We sang of his dominion over all. And so for benediction this morning, I would like to read a few verses out of Ephesians chapters 4 and 5. So feel free to open your Bibles or your Bible app to Ephesians 4 and 5. And the verses I will read are Paul's instruction to the church as to what they should focus on in their lives. And after I've read these verses, Marge will play through the song Everlasting, giving us some time to think about what we have heard this morning, to think about the songs we have sung, to think about the truths we have heard. After she has played through the song once, the worship team will again lead us in that song. And that will be the close of our service. So follow along as I read a few of these verses from Ephesians 4, starting with verses 1 and 2. As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. And then 4.17. So I tell you this, and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. And then chapter 4, verses 22 to 24. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, and to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. And then chapter 4, 32 till 5, verse 2. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. In chapter 5, verses 8 to 10, For you were once darkness, But now you are a light in the Lord. Live as children of the light, for the fruit of the the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth, and find out what pleases the Lord. And then verses 15 to 20 of chapter 5. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine. In other words, don't let anything control your senses. So do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, amen. Marge will play through the song once, giving us some time to reflect, and then we'll sing the song again. <laughs> 